anyone who has ever been in a conversation they don't want to be in might sympathize with me on this one. I was in a local establishment one night. It was late, loud, smoky, and I found myself in a conversation with someone that I would find out about 30 seconds later I didn't want to be in a conversation with. Let's just say I was friends with someone this person was friends with, and in the context of that, it was one of those situations where everybody else at the table leaves for a few minutes, so it was just me and this other person for a few minutes, and I found myself on the receiving end of some awkward conversation. Sometimes in conversations like this, when people find out I'm into history, sometimes they take that as an opportunity to espouse their historical and political views, and as we all know, that always goes well. After asking my favorite historical topic in a totally shocking move, this person then steered the conversation to what they wanted to talk about, which I soon found out was World War II, and in particular, Hitler. And here we go. This person began to tell me about how Yes, the Nazis were horrible, and yes, the Holocaust was awful, but you know what? Hitler sure knew how to motivate people. Say what you want about his policies, but he sure was an effective leader. Yes, the war and the genocide and all that were bad, but Hitler actually fixed the German economy after the Great Depression, so you have to take the good with the bad. Again, this is what this person is telling me right off the bat about 30 seconds into our conversation. And as I sat there totally flabbergasted, I realized I probably shouldn't be. Believe it or not, I've actually had essentially this exact conversation multiple times with real people. Set aside the fact that this probably isn't the best topic of conversation for someone you just met, Over the past couple years, I've found myself in the position of trying to refute this nonsense on the one hand, while trying to figure out why people believe stuff like this in the first place. What makes someone come up with a belief like this? You have to believe that people are not trying to defend Hitler or the Nazis, but then why even make statements like this? A more cynical person than me might question the motivations of, first of all, the person espousing this belief, but also the motivations of why this myth of Nazi economic progress and effective leadership has seemingly become prevalent, or if not prevalent, at least lurking in the shadows. There's this idea that comes to mind where, are you really talking about the Nazi economy, or are you talking about something else and trying to make excuses for Hitler or some sort of worldview that might have connections to Hitler. Honestly, I'm not sure. So, that being said, did Hitler fix the German economy? The argument that people make, at least the one that I've heard from these types of people, who I've had conversations with, goes something like this. The Great Depression slammed Germany. Life was horrible there, with unemployment, and inflation and all that. But in the 1930s, with Hitler in power, unemployment went way down. Stuff like gross domestic product, gross national product, overall health of the economy goes up. Inflation went down after the Great Depression. So even though Hitler did some horrible things, he did improve the economy and improve the lives of a lot of people. This is the basic argument that I've heard. In my view, This argument and this claim that Hitler fixed the Nazi economy is misleading at best and downright malicious at worst. So before we break down this argument, some context is needed to set the stage. To understand the Nazi economy, you have to understand one basic fact. The entire economic apparatus was designed for one thing and one thing only, war. 
When Hitler took power in 1933, his primary goal was to get Germany rearmed and ready to launch his war. So everything Hitler and the Nazi party implemented from a governmental or economic point of view was aimed at this. Here's Hitler's own words in 1933. Quote, The next five years in Germany must be devoted to the rearmament of the German people. Every publicly supported job creation scheme must be judged by the criterion of whether it is necessary from the point of view of the rearmament of the German people. This principle must always and everywhere stand in the foreground. Germany's position in the world will be decisively conditioned by the position of Germany's armed forces. Upon this, the position of Germany's economy in the world also depends. End quote. Over the course of the Third Reich's 12 or so years in power, Hitler and his economic people really meddled in the economy to a very large extent. And once again, the goal was to get Germany prepared for war, and once the war started, to execute the war. Just as sort of an aside here, many have said this meddling in the economy in many ways resembles a socialist economy, and there's been a move to rebrand the Nazis as socialists in recent years. This seems to make sense on some levels, as typically many people associate socialism with government control over certain sectors of the economy, but not so fast. Ultimately, the Nazis stopped short of fully nationalizing certain sectors of the economy, And historian Richard J. Evans, who I will be quoting quite a bit in this episode from his Third Reich trilogy, says that the Nazi economy is difficult to describe in many ways because it is so irrational. And like all things the Nazis did, it was totally infused with their political ideology. But it's probably best to describe it as some sort of fusion of a corrupt capitalist system with elements of a command economy. So you have this bizarre contradiction where capitalism is certainly a big part of the Nazi economy and companies, businesses that are willing to play ball with the Nazis could profit in enormous ways. But on the other hand, you do have this command style economy where the government is meddling in things quite a bit. Historian Richard J. Evans talks about this paradox a little bit and offers his thoughts based on his historical research. He says, quote, Was the Nazi economy moving away from free enterprise capitalism altogether? There is no doubt that in the course of the war, the regime intervened ever more intrusively in the economy, to an extent that amounted to far more than merely steering it in certain directions, or forcing it to work within the political context of a global war. Price and exchange controls, the regulation of labor and raw materials distribution, the capping of dividends, forced rationalization, the setting and resetting of production targets, and much more besides, constituted a drastic deformation of the market. The state's vast and precipitous increase in armaments expenditure distorted the market by pulling resources away from consumer goods production and towards arms-related and heavy industries. Industry thus came increasingly to serve the purposes and interests of an ideologically driven political regime. Striking though these developments were, however, they did not do much to alter the fact that Germany was still a capitalist economy, dominated by private enterprise. Regulation was widespread and intrusive, but it was carried out by many different, often competing institutions and organizations. Industrial managers and company executives managed to preserve at least some freedom of action, but they were acutely aware that their autonomy was being increasingly restricted during the war, along with the operation of a free market economy, and they were deeply worried that the regime would go over to a fully, quote-unquote, socialist, state-run economy. Joseph Goebbels, widely regarded as a socialist, was a particular boogeyman in this respect. But the growing economic empires of the SS and the Hermann Goring works, among others, were a cause of anxiety as well. Such concerns drove many businessmen and industrialists to cooperate with the regime as much as they could, in order to ward off, as they thought, even more drastic encroachments on their decision-making powers. 
Thus, managers, executives, and company chairmen were more than willing to take advantage of the many inducements the state had to offer, most notably, of course, the provision of lucrative arms contracts. German businesses benefited from the activities of the SS as well. The Dresdner Bank, for example, issued credits to the SS, and senior executives were rewarded by being made officers in the organization. Its services to the SS included providing loans for construction works in Schossenhausen and finance for the buildings of Crematorium II in Auschwitz. Huta, the small firm that built the gas vans used to kill Jews at Shulmno and elsewhere, the engineering company of Topf and Sons, who provided the ovens for the crematoriums at Auschwitz, and many other firms were only too happy to profit from the business of death. Some, such as the company that supplied Zyklon B to Auschwitz, may possibly have been unaware of the use to which their products were being put, but in most cases it was only too obvious. Those who processed the gold from the dental fillings extracted from the corpses of Jews killed at Auschwitz and other death camps can have had few doubts as to the providence. After collection at the camps, the fillings were sent to a refinery operated by the Frankfurt-based Degussa firm, Germany's leading company for the processing of precious metals. The gold was melted down and made into bars along with other gold materials, jewelry, and the like, taken from Jews and others in the conquered areas of Europe. Although it has been estimated Degussa earned about 2 million Reichsmarks from the plundering of the Jews between 1939 and 1945, 95% of the firm's gold intake between 1940 and 1944 came from loot. Degussa earned such profits by selling the gold on via the Reichsbank to finance houses such as the Deutsche Bank. The origin of much of this gold was clear enough to those who processed it on the factory floor. The fillings arrived at the Degussa factory for processing, as one worker recalled long after the war, in a condition that made it all too clear where they had come from. And here's the worker quoting, quote, The crowns and the bridges, there were those where the teeth were still attached. That was the most depressing, the fact that everything was still there. It was probably just like it had been when broken out of a mouth. The teeth were still there and sometimes still bloody and with pieces of gum on them, end quote. Okay, so that was a very long quote but I think it's important to set up some context. And I think Richard Evans does a great job of talking about some of the nuances of that Nazi economy, in particular in relation to claims that the Nazi economy was socialist in nature. It seems that Richard J. Evans is arguing that the Nazi economy would probably be better described as some sort of ideologically driven market-based capitalism gone totally haywire. At any rate, switching gears back to the Hitler fixed the German economy argument, we'll start with the unemployment argument. So people who make this argument that Hitler fixed the Nazi economy typically point to unemployment. These people will typically give the stat that 6 million people were unemployed in 1933 when the Nazis took power, and by 1939, Only around 300,000 people were unemployed. So you can definitely see how someone would take a look at this simple stat, which is pretty much accurate, and then make claims about the overall impact of the Nazis on the economy. But it's not that simple. This is a case where, again, historical context matters, and where statistics like this can sometimes be misleading. So now that we've heard this unemployment argument and we've heard the stats, let's dive in. First of all, at least in my experience, these unemployment numbers are essentially the pillar of the Hitler fixed the economy argument. This is the first thing that these folks will mention. That being said, most serious economists don't take unemployment as a statistic too seriously. It might be useful as a snapshot look at things, but other than that, not so much. Here's why in the case of Nazi Germany should be said that Hitler did invest in some job creation schemes. The famous German Autobahn, the highway that connected many different parts of Germany, was a Nazi scheme that put people to work building these huge highways across Germany. Hitler wanted to have a motorized society to provide employment for men, but again, the primary goal was rearmament. 
being able to move cars, tanks, planes from place to place was obviously important for Hitler. So schemes like this to put people to work in the German war economy did put a lot of people to work, but not the millions of people that many think did. A far easier way to reduce the unemployment number was simply to cook the books. One way to do this is to take women out of the labor force completely and therefore reduce the number of unemployed people because women no longer count. This would have the added benefit in the Nazi view of opening up jobs for men. Hitler said, quote, We do not consider it correct for the woman to interfere in the world of the man, in his main sphere. We consider it natural if these two worlds remain distinct. To the one belongs the strength of feeling, the strength of the soul. To the other belongs the strength of vision, toughness of decision, and of the willingness to act. End quote. You can start to see how Nazi ideology, and in particular Hitler's view of how the social order in Germany should be, was infecting the economy. There's many economists who say the Nazi party only hamstrung their own war effort by essentially refusing to allow women to contribute to the war economy until much later in the war. But in Hitler's view, by taking women out of the workforce, he could then put more men into the workplace, replacing women who no longer were working. But contrary to what Nazi propaganda was putting out there, this taking of women out of the workforce to open up jobs for men didn't work in reality, only on paper and in statistics. Richard J. Evans talks about this process where the Nazis removed women from the workforce in the hopes of replacing them with men, and also using this in combination with the Nazi policy of giving out marriage loans, which were designed to keep women at home. He says, quote, The main difference the marriage loans made, therefore, was to overall employment statistics. They did not, in reality, create space for unemployed men to get back to work, for no unemployed steelworker or construction laborer was likely to take up household cleaning or weaving, no matter how desperate his situation might be. End quote. There were other ways to cook the books on unemployment numbers as well. For example, in some cities, simply redefining what type of paperwork and registration one had to have to count as unemployed changed the numbers significantly. Richard J. Evans also adds to this that, quote, in addition, new regulations were introduced cutting working hours in some branches of trade and industry, making it necessary to employ more workers, but cutting the wages of those already in employment quite substantially. End quote. Combine this unemployment book cooking with the fact that worldwide, for the most part, the overall economy everywhere was gradually on the rise after the Great Depression and also combine this with the fact that virtually any economic metric you want to give during the reign of the Third Reich, very rarely did any of those numbers actually rise above pre-depression levels of the Weimar Republic that Hitler hated so much. So combine all that together, and those unemployment stats are starting to look less and less impressive. Also keep in mind that by 1933, Germany was effectively a police state, Anyone refusing to get on board with the public work schemes or the rearmament schemes could be sent to concentration camps. In addition, we didn't even mention that Jews didn't count as people, so why should they count towards unemployment? That being said, rearmament schemes and companies that began producing ships, guns, tanks, planes, and other items necessary for war did begin to hire more people to produce all of this stuff. So that soaked up some of the unemployment figures as well. But again, if you live in Germany at this time, with the benefit of hindsight, who cares if the unemployment number goes down a little bit if you're going to be dead in a few years because of the war that this rearmament campaign is preparing for? In other words, and we'll talk more about this later in the episode, but Strictly isolating the economy and not focusing on any of the other stuff that the Nazi state was up to is a fruitless endeavor. In my view, at least, one of the primary measures of a healthy economy should be the well-being and 
economic health of the actual people of Germany who make up the economy. And it's tough to argue that by 1945, as a result of Nazi economic, political, and foreign policy decisions, which I've argued are all intertwined, it's tough to argue that in 1945, the people of Germany were very well off as their cities lay destroyed, millions of their people were killed in war, and the specter of rebuilding amidst the carnage was evident. At any rate, back to unemployment, the last way to artificially get the unemployment number down for the Nazi party was through compulsory military service. By 1935, military conscription was reintroduced in Germany, flying against the hated Treaty of Versailles, I might add. This significantly decreased unemployment numbers as well. When factoring in all of these methods to reduce unemployment, Richard J. Evans says that by 1936, quote, after 1936, Hitler and the leading Nazis did not trouble to mention the battle for work ever again. The fact that it had been won had long since been accepted by the overwhelming majority of the German people. End quote. Perhaps that view is still not uncommon. Another key principle of the Nazi economy, in addition to reducing unemployment and getting the country ready for war, was the concept of self sufficiency. Historian Richard J. Evans says, quote, From the outset, Hitler wanted Germany to be economically self sufficient. In preparation for the coming war, the German economy had to be freed from its dependence on foreign imports. Hitler had seen the effects of the Allied blockade of Germany in the First World War. He'd seen it for himself. A malnourished and discontented population, arms production hamstrung by lack of basic raw materials. He did not want this to happen again. Autarky, the Nazi term for self-sufficiency, was a basic precept of Nazi economies from the early 1920s on. It took up a large part of the economic discussion, such as it was, in Hitler's politico-autobiographical tract, My Struggle. It was intimately connected with another basic idea of Nazi policy, that of the conquest of living space in Eastern Europe, which Hitler believed would secure food supplies for Germany's urban population. Thus, from the outset, Nazi policy focused on withdrawing trade from international markets and reorienting it towards countries, for example, in southeastern Europe, which one day would be part of the Nazi empire. End quote. This policy of autarky or self-sufficiency leaked into every part of the German economy and notably led to significant decreases in imports from the quote-unquote usual countries. In many places in Germany, this became a problem with the essentials, namely food. By the time the war broke out, many rural areas were struggling to eat. The Nazi solution to this was rationing. So certain amounts of food and other supplies could be consumed, and much of it was taken by soldiers and military and weapons factory workers who had first dibs. In typical Nazi fashion, this ideological economic policy of self-sufficiency connected to the military because it now became necessary to get more living space or Lebensraum for the people to acquire raw materials and give people new avenues to produce rearmament materials. Make no mistake about it, this was a system designed to plunder and swindle anything that didn't serve the Nazi war aim. Regardless of really anyone or anything that cautioned him otherwise, Hitler had no intention of easing up on his dream of rearmament, even if it threw huge wrenches into the economy and was unsustainable from a spending and budget perspective. Richard J. Evans says, quote, The pace of rearmament quickened still further. As Schacht had predicted, by 1938, expenditure on preparations for war was clearly spiraling out of control. 9,137 million Reichsmarks were spent on the army, compared to 478 million in 1933. 1,632 million were spent on the Navy, compared to 192 million five years earlier. 6,026 million were spent on the Air Force, compared to 76 million in 1933, including expenditure on administration and on the redemption of MIFO bills, rearmament costs had risen from 1.5% of national income in 1933 
to 7.8% in 1934, to 15.7% in 1936, and 21% two years later, where national income itself had almost doubled in the same period. The Reich's finances, which had recorded a modest surplus in 1932, recorded a deficit of 796 million Reichsmarks in 1933, rising to nearly 9.5 billion in 1938. Acting now in his capacity as president of the Reichsbank, Schacht wrote a personal letter to Hitler on January 7, 1939, signed by all the other directors of the Reichsbank, in which he warned that overstretching public expenditure was rapidly leading to the looming danger of inflation. The limitless expansion of state expenditure, they told Hitler, is destroying every attempt to put the budget in order. Despite an enormous tightening of the screw of taxation, it is bringing the finances of the state to the edge of ruin, and from this position it is wrecking the bank of issue and its currency. Hitler's response was to sack him along with the entire board of directors a few days later on January 20th, 1939. End quote. So you see anyone that is telling Hitler, hey, look, wait a second, we're spending way too much money, we don't have a diverse economy, and we're headed for a disaster. Anyone who said that to Hitler was sacked. And Hitler knew all these things, he just felt like the solution to all his problems was war. Capturing, plundering, and looting the other countries of Europe. So once again, Actual real economics is subordinate to Nazi politics and Nazi ideology. Keep in mind that the person in charge of the so-called four-year plan, which Hitler called his economic plan to get the country ready for war, was Hermann Goering. At this point, not only did he know absolutely nothing about economics and finance, but he was a morphine addict and a loose cannon, subject to the vanities of Hitler's frequent changes of mind and his political nonsense. As we've said several times now, another factor to consider is that it's impossible to separate the economy from the people who make the economy work. And in the case of Nazi Germany and Hitler, if you weren't a Nazi, or at least a willing collaborator, then you weren't going to benefit from this new war economy. With this us-first-them mentality firmly entrenched in Nazi Germany, Jewish people and businesses in particular faced the brunt of Nazi discrimination and abuse, whether it was tax laws or property laws or financial manipulation or outright beatings and vandalism by the SS, Hitler's goal was to remove an entire group of people from the economy and from Germany as a whole. Historian Richard J. Evans talks about this a little bit, saying, quote, The powers that accompanied the plan, notably the rationing of key raw materials, were deliberately used to disadvantage Jewish firms. The government now amended an emergency decree, first passed under Heinrich Brüning, to prevent the flight of large amounts of capital from Germany by lowering the sum at which the decree became operative from 200,000 Reichsmarks to 50,000, and basing it on the estimated taxable value of the property rather than on the sum it realized on sale. As a consequence, Jews who emigrated were subject in practice to the loss of far more than 25% tax provided for by the Brunning Decree. In 1932 and 33, this tax had brought in less than a million marks in revenue to the state. By 1935 and 36, this income had risen to just under 45 million. In 1937 and 38, more than 80 million. In 1938-39, 342 million. In addition, transfers of capital abroad were subject to a fee of 20% levied by the German Gold Discount Bank, through which the transfers had to be handled. In June 1935, this fee was raised to 68%, in October 1936, 81%, and in June 1938, 90%. Thus, Jewish companies and individuals were being systematically plundered, not just by other businesses and by the Nazi party, but also by the state and its dependent institutions as well, End quote. Again, this was a complex system of legal plunder and thievery against a particular group of people. 
Richard J. Evans goes on to say, quote, At this point, it was clear to everyone involved that the final stage was now commencing. To expedite matters, Goring and the Interior Ministry issued a decree on April 26, 1938, forcing every Jew or non-Jewish spouse of a Jew to declare all assets held at home and abroad over the value of 5,000 Reichsmarks. Following this up with internal discussions on the ultimate exclusion of the Jews from the economy altogether. Further orders barred Jews from acting as auctioners, from possessing or selling arms, and a particularly serious blow from signing legal contracts. By this time, pressures on Jewish owned companies had become well nigh irresistible. Since the fall of 1937, local authorities had been ordering the erection of signs outside Jewish businesses designating them publicly as such, a clear invitation to harassment, boycott, and attack. There were nearly 800 organizations in January to October of 1938, including 340 factories and 22 private banks. The pace was now increasing. In February 1938, there were still 1,680 independent Jewish tradesmen in Munich, for example. By October 4th, this number had fallen to 666, and two-thirds of these were in possession of a foreign passport. The final removal of all the Jews from the German economy was clearly within sight, and many German businesses and individuals were ready to reap the rewards. End quote. The reality of this situation is that in what was still in many ways a market economy, sometimes when one ship sinks, the water level rises, for the other ships. Other businesses and businessmen had no qualms enriching themselves at the expense of Jewish people being abused and removed from the economic realm in the 1930s. One businessman from Munich was clearly disgusted by this and wrote in a letter that he was, quote, so disgusted by the brutal and extortionate methods employed against the Jews that, from now on, I refuse to be involved in any way with organizations, even though this means losing a handsome consultancy fee. As an experienced, honest, and upstanding businessman, I can no longer stand idly by and countenance the way many Aryan businessmen, entrepreneurs, and the like are shamelessly attempting to grab up Jewish shops and factories etc., as cheaply as possible, and for a ludicrous price. These people are like vultures, swarming down with bleary eyes, their tongues hanging out with greed, to feed upon the Jewish carcass. End quote. Perhaps not surprisingly, Nazi leaders in particular benefited from plundering Jewish businesses, swindling political prisoners, and generally acting as the corrupt overlords of the German economy. Hermann Goring, in particular, infamously benefited from laws that didn't require Nazi leaders to show their taxes, and he used plunder and kickbacks to finance multiple hunting lodges as a result of his plundering, a couple of villas, a castle, a private train. The list goes on and on and on. The reality of the situation is that the Nazi economy didn't even succeed if you measure it by its own metrics. They weren't fully economically prepared for the war that they were about to start. The economy wasn't keeping up with Hitler's goals for war and rearmament. Yes, gross national product or gross national income did increase under Hitler's reign. Germany was producing more stuff but it all served the purpose of rearmament, and it wasn't a diverse economy that could sustain itself through the next decade or so, much less through a world war. Germany was producing stuff at a high rate, but they weren't consuming as much either. Richard J. Evans highlights some of the major problems in the German economy under Hitler. He says, quote, There are few more durable historical legends than that of the Blitzkrieg as an economic strategy designed to wage war cheaply and quickly without putting the economy on a war footing. The economy was on a war footing well before the war began. Private consumption declined from 71% of national income in 1928 to 59% in 1938. 
and real earnings failed to recover to their pre-depression levels by the time the war broke out. Real wages in Germany had grown by 9% in 1938 compared to their 1913 levels, but the comparable figure in the USA was 53% and in the UK 33%. The quality of many goods in Germany, from clothing to foods, declined under the impact of import restrictions during the 1930s. When the war began, the finance ministry and the four-year plan agreed that personal consumption had to be limited, mainly through rationing, to no more than the minimum necessary for staying alive. Taxes on beer, tobacco, cinemas, theaters, travel, and other aspects of consumption were increased, and all taxpayers had to pay an emergency war surtax. As a result, taxes increased by 20% on average for people, mostly working class, who were earning between 1,500 and 3,000 Reichsmarks a year between 1939 and 1941, and 55% for those earning between 3,000 and 5,000 Reichsmarks. Taxation provided half the income needed for military expenditure, the other half being covered by exactions from the occupied territories and by government loans, end quote. Richard J. Evans goes on to talk about how Hitler decided to actually plunder people's savings accounts to help finance the war as well. So obviously there were plenty of problems in the Nazi economy, and even by Nazi metrics, the economy was not up to snuff. A good analogy might be a fancy car that looks nice from the outside, but once you open up the hood, you realize it's empty. There's no substance. Again, Hitler and his leadership knew this. So their solution was to turn to plunder, rationing, and spending. Certainly not ideal for the average person living in Nazi Germany. Richard J. Evans says, quote, Measured by its own aims, the Nazi regime had only succeeded partially, at most, by the summer of 1939. Its preparations for large-scale war were inadequate. Its armament programs incomplete Drastic shortages of raw materials meant that targets for the construction of tanks, ships, planes, and weapons of war were not remotely being met, and the situation was exacerbated by Hitler's own inability to set stable and rational priorities within the rearmament program. The answer was plunder. The corruption, extortion, expropriation, and downright robbery that became the hallmarks of the regime and its masters and servants at every level in the course of the Aryanization program put plunder at the heart of the Nazi attitude towards the property and livelihood of peoples they regarded as non-Aryan. The enormous stresses and strains built up in the German economy between 1933 and 1939 could, Hitler explicitly argued on several occasions, ultimately only be resolved by the conquest of living space in the East. Meanwhile, the German people had to make the sacrifices. The regime bent all its efforts towards building up production while keeping the lid firmly on consumption. Shortages of fat, butter, and other consumables, not to mention luxury items such as imported fruit, had become a standard part of daily life by 1939. People were constantly exhorted to make contributions to savings schemes of one kind and another. Savings were directed into government bonds, loan certificates, and tax credits, so that the vast bulk of them became available for spending on arms. People were remorselessly exhorted to save, save, rather than spend, spend, spend. Compulsory pension schemes were introduced for the self-employed that forced them to invest funds in insurance companies which the government could then draw upon to help finance rearmament. At the same time, government departments and the military often delayed paying contracts for well over a year thus extracting from them what was in effect a kind of hidden loan. In many small and medium-sized enterprises, engaging on arms production or arms-related projects, this created cash flow problems so serious that they were sometimes unable to pay their workers their wages on time. The regime justified all this with its customary rhetoric of sacrifice for the greater good of the German racial community. End quote. Keep in mind that this is all before the war. I don't think I have to go over the effects that World War II would ultimately have on the German economy by 
the conclusion of the war, we know the effects that the war would have on Germany. We know the destruction that would be rained down upon German civilians during the war. Not only was Hitler's German economy inefficient in the moment, the ideology driving it was guaranteed to destroy Germany from the start. And in a few short years, it did just that. Ultimately, you can't separate the economy from the society and the people who live in it because they are the ones that have to live by the short-term and long-term repercussions. And the basis of the Nazi economy was war and dehumanization and destruction and plunder and robbery. Plain and simple. It wasn't effective, it wasn't an improvement, and it wasn't good. You can't separate the ideology from the economy, society, war effort, politics, etc. It's like a parasite that infects the host until it collapses. And as I continue rambling here into minute 45 of this episode, it starts to strike me why this myth of Nazi economic progress can be so convincing. It takes about 20 seconds to reel off some unemployment or economic stats, but it takes 45 minutes with the aid of good historical scholarship from Richard J. Evans to debunk that 20 seconds of statistics. Ultimately, even if the economy did improve under Hitler, which I think I've shown is inaccurate, or at the very least, extremely misleading, who cares? Is a modest uptick in an economy worth all of the suffering and all of the death and all of the misery that the Nazis caused all around the world? Is it okay for some lives to improve at the expense of innocent human beings? All questions worth asking, in my view. But getting back to the question of the episode, did Hitler fix the Nazi economy? No. Alright, so that was an episode that I had brewing around in my head for a little bit and finally got it put together. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm never really sure how these things turn out. Um, sometimes it's tough for me to judge these things when you're kind of in your own bubble, in your own world, making it. So let me know what you think. I do want to say another thank you to the people who have supported on Patreon. Right now, our operation is small, but we have room for aggressive expansion. So you can get on there, and if you want to contribute, you can get access to a bunch of perks. Uh, we have the bonus feed. We're up to four bonus episodes now. Um, so there's the bonus episodes. There's some other perks as well. So if you want to go on and contribute on Patreon, there's a link in the show notes. Uh, if you don't want to do that, or if you can't do that, there's other ways to support as well. Believe it or not, anybody can write anything on the internet, and you too can jump into the fray if you want to leave a rating, if you want to write a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. That certainly makes a big difference. It's very much appreciated, and hopefully it can add some positivity to the world of the internet. So all kinds of ways to support there. If you want to support on Patreon, go for it. You can also leave reviews or ratings. You can tell a friend. You can subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to on. All great things and all things I very much appreciate. So I think that's about all I have to say here. As always, thank you for listening. You guys are awesome. I really do appreciate it a lot, and that's it for me.